Run it back for the boys from 69. Back for the fans on 12th and Pine. Run it back to back and raise it high. Hello, Chiefs Kingdom, and welcome to the MK Chiefs Cast Live from the Wolf Den Special Edition, where I am joined by a very special guest. As always, I'm Josh, and I am talking with Jordan Mannix, columnist for Arrowhead Addict. Make sure to follow him on Twitter. His handler, handle is at chief in stl and our sponsor of course is complete weddings and events your leading provider of photo video dj photo booth lighting and coordination services so uh jordan thank you for being here this evening yeah no problem man i'm, I'm excited to talk some chiefs out of the big game yeah absolutely uh but before i get into the questions i actually do have to give a shout out to arrowhead addict your bar finder is uh really our first public place that we were um I, uh, I've, I've known the people that we have in our watch party and group since uh, game one of the 2013 season. So the, the oh, Jags no game when, when Reed was there. Yeah. Very and uh, cool, so, so I actually met um, all the, uh, the OGs. So I'm not even a founding member of the group. Uh-huh. But I, I tell everybody I commercialize the group. So I, <laughs> I I got us up on the Arrowhead Attic Bar Finder. And that that's about as good of a uh, place for a traveling fan to oh, for sure, man. look for a place for to sure. go. I mean, yeah. I've, I've had a bunch of travel gigs for, for work. And I'm always trying to uh-huh. find places to watch a game. And it's never easier than finding the Chiefs yeah. fan so very cool well, good good to know it worked out for you yeah shout there uh so let's get into let's get into this the stuff tonight so the first okay. thing what were your key takeaways from the AFC championship game when did you know that game yeah. was in hand yeah so um there was a lot there I mean honestly I think the first thing that you know sticks out obviously because the Chiefs I mean they they just blew them out right I mean Outside of the muffed punt, I mean, they went on a 38-6 run. So I think the biggest thing for me is that the switch is a real thing. So that was kind of talked about ad nauseum, you know, in the national sports media was, you know, where the Chiefs were playing these teams. And I think they hadn't won a, you know, a game by more than one score in, in the past, like, six or seven games leading into the playoffs. And everybody thought, you know, they that was going to be – a huge problem for them, especially as they were coming into, you know, play a a hot team like, you know, the Bills who had actually blown like a number of teams out. And I heard time and time again, (laughs) yeah, I heard time and again how, you know, which to me, I always thought this was like a silly point, but, you know, I I follow DVOA pretty closely. and, And the guy who puts that together would always say, you know, one of you know, the biggest ways you can tell a team is really good is if they blow out bad teams. And I just always thought that was weird because it's like, in my mind, beating good teams seems like, you know, a better barometer for for a team being a great team than, you know, blowing out bad teams. But either way, I think that the Bills game and and really the first half of the Cleveland game where they were kind of slicing and dicing them proved that, you know, the Chiefs were kind of, you know, I mean, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, they were in cruise control pretty much, you know, the last half of the season. And so that was a big one. Um, You know, the other thing, there's a couple others. Obviously, the offense looked incredible. And the, the really cool thing is that's still without Sammy Watkins, which we'll see what his production's, you know, gonna be in the Super Bowl. But just simply having him back um, is, is, you know, they have to account for him. He's got the speed. He's got, he's the type of guy that if he catches it in the open field, he can make a play. And really outside of, of Travis Kelsey and Tyree Kill, we haven't had that for most of the second half of the season. So that's going to be a huge problem for the Bucks, I think. Um, so just seeing the Chiefs do that really to a, a defense that had been playing really well up to that point was also an awesome thing to see. Um, And then, man, the defense, you know, I coming into the season, I had really high expectations. Like I I thought they'd make a jump from, you know, kind of middle of the pack defense to a top 10 defense. And we didn't really see that, honestly, for most of the season. I mean, we we would see it a game here or a game there. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, I felt like when we played better competition, that's when we would see it the most. But it just wasn't. We, we never got like this dominant kind of consistent performance. And I just think, I mean, the last two games, 
I think it was they've only allowed 17 points to to both opponents. I mean, granted the the Buffalo Bills did score 24, but again, you know, I, I don't really count the muff punt. I mean, they're on the oh, two yard line. Not. I mean, to me, that's just kind of, you know, I, again, maybe call it semantics, but to me, that just doesn't count. And so you look at that and it's like both the Browns and, I mean, the Browns put up 48 points against the Steelers and then the Chiefs held them to 17. And, you know, the Bills were, were cruising. Granted, they, they had a rough game against Baltimore, but that was a really windy game. So that was another huge takeaway um, is just that, honestly, I mean, both the offense and defense are clicking on both cylinders. And then what I would say as far as when I knew it was over, I actually went into the game super confident. So I, I kind of went in with the idea that, like, you know, the Bills didn't rush the passer particularly well. Yep. They all, they can't run the ball. Like, they literally cannot run the ball. Yep. And usually when you have a team that is so one-dimensional, um, I, I just had a really strong feeling that Spagnuolo was going to find a way to shut down Diggs. And, at, you know, as you've kind of seen, if, if teams can shut down Diggs, that takes away, like, 70% of, of their offense because mm-hmm. – I mean, that's the guy that Allen targets, like, you know, probably like 60 to 70% of the time. And the Chiefs just did a really good job of that. And so, I don't know, I was very irritated at the muffed punt. But at the same time, I kept telling, you know, I was watching with a couple people and I was just like, it's going to be fine. Like, I, I really was never worried. And probably in the second quarter, I was like, man, they're just tearing them up. And so, I think I think pretty early on I, I was fairly confident the Chiefs were gonna were gonna advance. I'd say I had a pretty exact same experience. Um, I, I was saying some pretty not nice things at the muff punt, and I I've got my wife sitting there yeah. hitting me, going just oh, like man. you need to calm down. It's the first quarter, and they were down by twenty four yep. last year, and yep. like you know that, that that's fine. But I, I I was just so happy to see every single player prayed by, and then they go right back yeah. to Harmon. It's just like yeah. all right, we 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 got yep. this, and. I think that was for me was the moment the second that Hardman caught that touchdown pass. Oh, for sure. Oh, it's it's on. This is yeah. This is done. And I, I don't know what Spagnola is saying to the defense, but he needs to keep saying it, you know, because they're yeah. they're definitely getting stuff done. So oh yeah. So let's talk prep for mm-hmm. the Super Bowl. We've got you know the whole media week thing coming up. So you're you're part of the media. Um, mm-hmm. What what do you what do you do? differently during the the between time for the Super Bowl than you would during the regular season or is there anything yeah I mean I I wouldn't necessarily say I do anything uh completely different I mean I'm usually doing a decent amount of prep for you know the pieces that I'm writing during the week I think um I I'll probably do uh you know a deep dive going into next week probably put out you know a game preview piece that's what I that's what I usually do. Um, I haven't done that quite as much this year, um, just because there's been a lot of other stuff that I've been interested in. Um, but this one in particular, you know, I just like, you know, mentally for myself, like I've been a fan for, you know, two decades. So I kind of like to go in, you know, with a really good understanding of kind of like what to expect. And so um, I don't know that I would say there's going to be much of a difference. I, you know, I might do another podcast or two, but uh yeah, just, man, just trying to, you know, get my mind right and, and get as knowledgeable as I can because I, I think the Chiefs have a really good shot. Um, I'm not concerned, but this Bucks team is, is a really good team. But, uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, I, I feel like the Chiefs have a pretty good shot here. Yeah, obviously the Bucks team is uh, is good. Their defense is good, and, and any time yeah. Tom Brady's under center, I think you have to take whatever sure. that is seriously For regardless. Sure. So keys to victory in yeah. Super Bowl 55. What's the key for yeah. completing the run-up back tour? Right. So, you know, I, I obviously just looking at this from an offensive and defensive perspective. So I, I think for the offense, um, you know, probably the most obvious thing is the pass rush, right? So, um, you know, the Chiefs offensive line is – banged up I mean the the loss of Eric Fisher is you know that's a big one um definitely not super you know super optimistic when it comes to them just completely uh getting rid of this pass rush but I do feel like it's not something that I'm super nervous about because 
if you actually look at the times that they played, you know, big time passing offenses like the Chargers or the Falcons or the Raiders or um, the line, I mean, they gave up 400 yards, almost 400 yards to Herbert Carr, Matt Ryan twice. Alex Smith had, I think, 370 some yards against them. Stafford almost had 500 yards against them. And then obviously, Mahomes had 342, and a lot of that came in the first half. But, I mean, you know, maybe I'm being a little biased here, but the Chiefs took their foot off the gas in that game. Absolutely. It was 100% in hand by the time the the third quarter started. And so I I would say, you know, if if Mahomes doesn't throw for close to 400 yards, I'd be really surprised. So it's kind of funny because, you know, their pass rush is – Th- this you know really talked about as- aspect of their game and I mean they do they do pressure at the fourth highest rate in the league so that's something to consider but they also blitz at the fourth highest rate mm-hmm. the interesting thing though is they only convert sacks at the 10th highest rate so you know it's it's one of those things where they're not actually sacking the quarterback which to me you know obviously you, you don't want Mahomes getting you know hit a bunch but if they're not getting to Mahomes and sacking him on a regular basis, I'm still feeling pretty confident because I think Pro Football Focus, since they started taking the stat in like 2006, um, Mahomes is the best against against pressure ever. Yeah. And so yeah. you know that that obviously is going to be a key. Um, I think on defense, I, I feel pretty good here because the Chiefs have have shown you know a you know, they've shown ability in the last couple of games, especially to get to the quarterback. I mean, both Mayfield and Allen are more mobile than, than Brady is. I just feel like they're going to, they're going to be able to get to him. They all, they were only able to sack him one time um, in the first meeting, but I, I just think, again, I think that the chiefs left, left their foot off the gas. And if the chiefs are scoring a bunch of points, they're going to be dropping back more than they were last game. And so I just expect us to get to Brady. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people are going to make a big deal out of the run game and, and how, you know, I think the the Bucks ran for about 171 yards the first time around. Mm-hmm. I just don't really care about that because again, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if, if you follow kind of the advanced, I'm sure you do the advanced statistics, but it's, yep. You know, we've kind of entered into this era where it's very obvious that passing the ball is is far more efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I just expect both, like, again, if the Chiefs score a bunch of points, I really don't expect the Bucks to run the ball 30 times. Maybe they will. Maybe I will be, you know, shocked. And that that will be, mm-hmm. you know, the story of the game is is the Bucks ran for, you know, 240 yards. And that that's kind of what sealed the deal. I just think that, you know, if the Chiefs are able to, you know, attack their secondary, which is honestly the weakest part of their defense. I mean, they're 21st against the pass. We're going to have points early and they're just not going to be able to run the ball. And then the last thing I'd say is the thing I don't think is getting enough kind of press is the Reed versus Arians debate. And yeah, I mean, honestly, I was actually thinking about it today, you know, with the whole Brady and Belichick make breakup. Um, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not denigrating Belichick here, but I mean, I, you do have to start to wonder and, and we'll see over the next couple of years, how it plays out, but you do have to wonder if, if Belichick wasn't a significant beneficiary of having Tom Brady, because obviously they didn't make the playoffs. Um, they looked pretty bad to end the season in a couple games. Mm-hmm. Um, and Brady, I mean, he, you know, granted they had their struggles early, but I mean, he still passed for over 40 touchdowns. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was in the mid four thousands in terms of yards. I mean, and granted, you know, I'm not saying Arians isn't like a bumpkin by any means, but, but again, it's one of those things where, I mean, he took this team to the Super Bowl. You got to start to wonder if Belichick wasn't a significant benefactor. And if that's the case, I mean, is there a coach you'd rather have than Andy Reid? Like, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure there's, I, outside of Belichick, there wouldn't be anyway. And and so I think Reid really is, if not the best coach, the second best coach in the league. 
And I mean, Arians might be top 10. Like he probably mm-hmm. is top 10 right now. He probably is. I mean, they're in the Super Bowl, but I mean, tell me what Bruce Arians has done that would merit him being a top five coach. Cause I don't think there is anything outside of this run, which again, you know, Brady's playing at a high level and, you know, he's one of the greatest of all time. It's kind of like, if they didn't at least make the make a deep run in the playoffs, that'd be a, a pretty significant mark against him. So I, I would say that's a big one that's that's not getting a lot of press. This isn't Bill Belichick. This isn't Brady and Belichick. I think mm-hmm. I think we're kind of forgetting like like it is Brady, but like does Arians have this like genius move up his sleeve like Belichick always seemed to? I just I don't see it and I don't think that's getting enough play. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think the most brilliant thing that Arians did, and if there's anything that puts him in the top five conversation, he knew when to get out of the way. And, yeah, exactly. you know, there, there's definitely a, <laughs> there's definitely a talent to that. And I, yeah, I can tell you sure. that I, uh, I, I always thought that Belichick was benefiting of, of having Brady. I, I would right. agree with you a hundred percent that the top two coaches are Belichick and Reed. And, and I can tell you that even Eagles fans that I know right now will, <laughs> will say that at this point and yeah. the amount of uh, wait for what you guys are in for that, that I got from all my, you know, Philly contacts oh, when, when that happened. Uh, I remember actually going to the Thursday night game where they put Donovan McNabb in their ring of fame and, um, uh-huh. Jamal Charles went crazy and uh, the, yeah. the Chiefs won that game. That was in Reed's first or second season. Yeah, I think it was his first year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was his first as well. And and I, I, of course, you know, went to Lincoln Financial Field, the link, you know, for people out uh-huh. there um, in, in a Chiefs shirt. And the the conversation that I probably had a hundred times was like, hey, what the heck? Uh, are you actually from Kansas City? I'm like, I'm from there. I'm an actual fan. I'm not in here to yeah. mess with you guys. I'm not a not Cowboys fan. Not a lot of Fairweather fan. fans at that point. Yeah, exactly. I'm not not a not a Cowboys fan or a Giants fan coming in here to mess with you guys. So just yeah. stop it. And they're just like, oh well, yeah. Good luck with Reed. He's horrible. And he is, and man. my response every single time was, you guys won nine out of fourteen divisional championships. What do you want from the guy? Right. It's like, right. what what can you possibly want? They're like, well, he doesn't know how to run a clock. And I, I love how since Mahomes has been yeah. on his team, that whole thing has completely gone away. And, oh, and my sure. whole thing is, yeah. maybe Donovan McNabb and Alex Smith didn't know how to run a clock. I, uh. and, yeah, I, I got to say, honestly, I mean, that that's one of the best. I mean, there's like 90 million things about Mahomes that are amazing. and But mm-hmm. I, I honestly, just his kind of like cerebral control of a game and just every factor, it's like, I mean, he just – I agree with you. I think he he's made a huge difference there for sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it just, he's got that whole thing that you can't teach yep. and, and that's it. I mean, they're, yep. it's crazy to watch. It's crazy to watch. It's like they figured the league out the way that um, you watch the NBA and one player just significantly right. changes everything. <laughs> and, and Mahomes has done that. And, and yep. kind of like the NBA, you can rest players. And uh, I mean, right. the terminology I've been using about like the second half of the, the Bucks game that you talked about, or even the second half of the season, it, it, you're watching a soccer game, you get the goal, you park the oh, bus yeah. and you're, and you're playing for the one goal win. And I yep. mean, that's yep. kind of what it seemed like we were doing. And uh, well, and, and even, even to that point, I mean, the thing that I, I don't know if, if maybe again, I'm, I'm just assuming here, but I've always felt like ever since Andy Reid came to town, like he's the type of guy, he's not looking to run up the score. He's looking to, to win the game and give the opponent as, and, and the rest of the opponents around the league as little as possible to prepare for, because, you know, he wants to come out and surprise people. So in my mind, it's like, you know, I, I think even more so this year with the talent that we had, and just how, how much Spagnolo has kind of impacted the defensive side of the ball, I just felt like he held back even more. And so, I mean, yeah. we'll see. Like, I, I could see us really, you know, kind of, you know, doing some unique things in the Super Bowl. So we'll see if I'm right. I, I could be totally wrong, but that's kind of how I feel about it. I, I agree. And at the same time, I mean, Sean Payton tried to run up the score week one and play the season <laughs> without Michael Thomas. Right, exactly. You know, there, there's reasons yep. not to do it. You yep. can hide the playbook, and you can also, you know, not do that. So, yep. Uh, yep. yeah. Any, sure. Anyway, so uh, I think we're both on the same page that we're expecting 
yeah. the, the Chiefs to win. So what's your score prediction and who's going to be the MVP? Yeah, so the score prediction is tough. I, I don't know if I'd necessarily do like an actual score prediction. I'm a little bit superstitious if I'm being completely honest, but Not I definitely <laughs> do think, I, I definitely do think, I mean, the Chiefs are favored right now in Vegas and and I, I know Vegas can't tell the future, but I, I will say that I always kind of look to that. And I, I think that that gives me like a little bit of, of, you know, positive emotion because mm -hmm. I mean, it would be really easy to pick the bucks here just because it's Brady. And sure. I think that's what we're going to see in the national media a lot is just, Oh my gosh, how could you pick against Brady? Yada, yada, yada. I just think the chiefs are in my mind, this is kind of how I break it down. The chiefs have the better quarterback. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, his career at this point is better than Brady's, but, mm -hmm. but, nobody would choose the performance of Brady over Mahomes right now. Like that would just be ludicrous. And so we definitely have the better quarterback. Um, they have a, a better coach. Again, that's a huge factor. Yeah. If you want to say, and, and I would actually say from a coaching staff standpoint, I, I like Spagnolo over Todd Bowles. That's not to say Bowles isn't a great, he's a very consistent coordinator in, in most cases, I just think Spagnolo has a really unique ability when they're going against a great team mm -hmm. to do something unique that completely shuts them down. I mean, just, you know, think back to New the York Giants Jones. beating the 18 and 0 Patriots in the Super Bowl. I mean, that mm -hmm. offense was mm -hmm. insane mm -hmm. and, you know, he completely shut them down. So I, I just think staff in general is much better for the Chiefs. And I mean, if you want to say, like, I think the Bucs are pretty comparable, if not even more even just slightly more talented just from top to bottom um, than the Chiefs. But again, I don't think it's enough. And I, I think when you're talking about the most important position of quarterback, um, you know, that's going to carry the day most of the time. So I definitely feel pretty good about the Chiefs. I, you know, if, if the Chiefs win, I, I'd be shocked if Mahomes doesn't get another Super Bowl MVP. Yeah. I mean, I guess if, you know, if Tyree Kill duplicates his performance, you know, or, or even exceeds it, um, the one that he had in the first game, you know, it, it's very possible that could net, you know, somebody like him or Kelsey could, could have like a 200 yard game and get the MVP. But, you know, Mahomes, I actually think right now is, is the odds on favorite to win the MVP. So I'll, yeah. I'll probably go with the Chiefs and Mahomes on that. So sounds good. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. And, uh, you know, big, big thing is just, don't let Brady have the ball in his hands with a chance to win with two minutes left. Uh, you know, stop that and control your own destiny. So, so let's uh, let's pivot a little bit to the off season that we have coming up. Do you see any key additions that we can yeah. potentially go for, or any players uh -huh. that we need to be prepared to lose? Like, what what yeah. are your thoughts there? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll start with players that, that we've got a chance of losing just because, you know, I think that'll kind of uh, color the conversation regarding players that we need to, we need to uh, look for. So I, I think there's a good chance um, that Schwartz, it, here's the thing. If Schwartz wants to come back and he's healthy, I think the Chiefs will welcome him back with open arms. Yeah, absolutely. And they'll they'll pay him, you know, what he deserves. Like, I, I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying that the Chiefs don't want Schwartz. I just, I sincerely wonder for a guy that started 134 games straight, um, I think he's missed. So what would it be the last 12 uh, and, and it doesn't sound like he's going to be ready for the Super Bowl. I just, it, it's back problems when you're talking about a guy who's over the age of 30. Um, he's played a lot of games in the NFL. He's made a lot of money too. And that, that's a factor for guys once they start getting up there when they've made a lot of money. I, I just could see him start to kind of evaluate things a little differently. Now, if I had a gut feeling, I do think he comes back, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if he, you know, decides to either, you know, take a year off or call it a quits. And then the other question is, you know, with Fisher, I, I don't necessarily think we're losing him, obviously. I think he's still got a year left on his contract, but an Achilles tear for a guy that size, I, I do wonder, especially this late in the season, if he doesn't miss most, if not all of next season. So I don't see a world where he doesn't yeah. miss at all, honestly. And, and then, I mean, you know, it's possible we re-sign him because I think if he does miss the entire next season, 
I That'd I don't it. know that demand's going to be super high, um, just because you know again it's going to be tough to to know for sure what he's going to be able to do after that. So I, I could see us resigning him, but I, I definitely think that's going to be you know a pretty large hole, you know, in our offensive line. So just from those two guys alone, I mean, I, I think the Chiefs need to probably sign somebody in the off season. And I haven't had a chance yet. I haven't really dove into the off season stuff yet. So I don't know who specifically is going to be um, free agents that the chiefs could target, but I definitely think they're going to want to bring in a veteran, which is going to be a challenge because it sounds like the cap's going to drop to about 180 million, which, you know, there's a lot of things that they can do. The cap's pretty flexible, but it'll be interesting to see if they're able to really, you know, patch up the offensive line with, with veterans and free agency. And then I think they probably need to at least draft, you know, two offensive linemen. They got to draft somebody early that can play right away. And then, and then probably somebody who, who's a project. Now, the, the one question is, you know, they've got Niang coming back and they've got LDT coming back. True. So yeah. LDT is definitely going to, you know, more than likely regain his starting role or at least be a heavy contributor It'll be interesting to see whether or not Yang's ready to go. So, I mean, he opted out, which, you know, obviously that makes sense, but, you yeah, know, was yeah. he, was he keeping himself, you know, up to speed? Is he going to be physically ready when the season comes around? I mean, that, that's, especially for an offensive lineman and guys that kind of like operate at a little bit bigger size usually can take them a little bit to get adjusted when they've come from, you know, having some time off. So, you know, all that to say, I think offensive line is going to be the big, the big question mark and the big target going into the off season. Um, I think the last two are a little bit smaller, but just things that they need to keep an eye on wide receiver. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what they do with Watkins. I'm not 100% sold that they would bring him back. If he was at the right price, I think they will just because the, the Chiefs front office has kind of shown a um, habit of just loving to bring guys back that have been on the team for a while. Yep. I mean, just think of, of Demarcus Robinson. I mean, you know, again, nothing against the guy personally. Um, he just hasn't been super productive outside of a game here or a game there, but they just, they continue to bring him back because he, he comes in at the right price. So I could see them bringing back Watkins if, again, he's, you know, willing to sign for that six or $8 million mark. I just wonder though if you know if they do end up winning a second Super Bowl, if he might want to go get you know one final payday before the end of his career. And then last thing really is linebacker. I mean, Willie Gay looks like he's got a lot of potential. Um, I just wonder, you know, outside of of him, who they really have kind of that they're developing. I mean, there's a couple guys, you know, that have some some potential, but I really think they need to beef up that unit. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see them, you know, make another draft selection early on at that position. So again, haven't dove in quite yet to the off season stuff, but that's kind of my initial thoughts. Gotcha. So let, let's get into, and I know you've written some recent articles about these. I think the other big piece that we need to think about with the off season and additions or, or subtractions, um, Eric B enemy, what, What's yeah. going to happen there? When is he finally going to get his head coaching yeah. job? And I, I think the, the question is starting to come into my head at this point is, <clears throat> has he found the job that he wants? Because yeah. I, I would hope at this point that him not having a head coaching job is at least yeah. 30% on him yeah. not wanting to go somewhere. Yeah, so, you know, that that's an interesting point. It's something that I've kind of been thinking about a little bit more lately. I mean, initially – my, you know, I wrote a piece about, you know, kind of why I thought it, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a piece that it was, I, I feel strongly about this in terms of, I know I'm right and everybody else is wrong, but I kind of heard, you know, the same sentiment, you know, on Twitter and just in the national media about, you know, why he wasn't getting the nod for a head coaching job. And so I thought I'd kind of, you know, flip the switch and, and look at it maybe from a different way. And, just kind of look at some of the the latest coordinate offensive coordinators in particular that, you know, have come from the Reed tree and gone on to coach. But I agree with you from the standpoint of, I, I think the enemy is probably the best of those three. Um, and just in terms of the way he relates to the guys, I mean, 
Yeah. I, you know, I don't really remember the players. I mean, they liked Nagy and they liked Peterson, but I didn't really remember them, you know, kind of talking in the glowing way that they do about Eric bien mm-hmm. So I think he really has, you know, these great relationships with these guys. And you do have to wonder, I mean, Reed, Reed is going to, I think he's, what is he, 69 now? Um, he's going to be 70. I mean, he definitely has a few more years left in him. I don't anticipate that he's going to retire you know, in the next two or three necessarily, but maybe Mm -hmm. four or five. And I mean, if you think about it from that standpoint, I mean, you're probably talking another 10 to 12 years of Mahomes. And I mean, if you're the enemy, like, is, is there a better situation than that? Like, not, it's not like he's got a bad job. I mean, it's, it's an incredible job. Exactly. And, and, and the other thing to consider is, you know, Mahomes is on this, you know, what really amounts to a 12 year contract at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, once you hit year seven or eight, you know, Mahomes is actually starting to become, especially if the cap keeps increasing and, and international exposure, which I expect to increase for the NFL over the next decade. If oh, those yeah. things keep growing, I mean, Mahomes might be a bargain. And then, and then you can, you know, stack the roster again and, and potentially, you know, like the Patriots were able to, to, you know, have one dynasty at the beginning and kind of one at the end there you might have the same situation. And it's just, I I think you're right. I I don't know. I don't know for sure if that's what's going on, but man, if you're the enemy, I agree. I I don't know that you're, you're just dying. Cause the other thing is working for Andy Reid has to be amazing. I mean, the guy literally, I mean, every single coach who's ever worked for him raves about him. And so, you know, I, I do wonder the same thing is, is this just, you know, unless there's the perfect opportunity and the enemy's just not feeling it, maybe that's why, you know, we've seen things, you know, happen the way that they have. Yeah. The one that I was really afraid of this off season was the chargers. Cause that yeah. seemed like a good fit for him. I was pretty, pretty happy when that didn't happen. Right. Um, I thought the jets were going to make a serious run for him and I could have seen a fit there. Um, Houston seems like a good fit if Deshaun yeah. Watson's staying, but you know, if not, I mean, just looking exactly. at the way all the players talk, why, why would yeah. you go there? Why would you go? Yeah. There? And I mean, that, that's the thing about Houston at this point. I mean, I, I, you know, and I, I remember kind of not early on, but kind of like, you know, the second level of that whole situation where the enemy was sort of reportedly, you know, he wasn't that interested in the job. And I mean, now that Watson wants out, I, I just, you know, if, if it were me, I, I don't know why you would go there. I mean, I, I just, it would be you know, to take a head know. coaching job. Yeah. And, and that's just simply <clears throat> whoever you're listening to. So think, think of like right. the, the players association, they want the best player to go and get the right. biggest contract possible. And right. when you're as good as Mahomes, you can buck that trend and just say, I don't care what you guys want me to do. I'm here to manage my own career. And right. you now maybe, maybe the enemy's doing a little bit of that and just saying, you know, I'm, I'm pretty cool with the succession plan that we have going here in Kansas city. Right. Uh, so a uh, <laughs> couple other articles I wanted to get onto. Um, I love the uh, most hated Broncos. Yeah. That was hilarious to me. Um, so two questions there. Um, do you have any other teams in mind that you're going to write something like that for? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'd actually, I had thought about doing one for the Raiders um, during their, uh, the second contest. I, I just didn't get around to it. I, I was a little bit too busy, but yeah, I'm definitely, sure. my plan is to hit everybody in the division um, just because, you know, that's obviously kind of the most interesting for fans and the Broncos was probably a good one to start with. Cause I mean, the I Raiders, the <laughs> I feel like everybody hates the Raiders, but like it, it's been a long time since the Raiders have been any good. So it's like the Broncos, they were really good for a stretch and that kind of fueled some of that. So I thought it was pretty, and, and they've also, they've got some interesting characters, you know, from the last like two decades. So that was, that was fun to do, but yeah, I, I think I'll definitely do um, the rest of the teams in the division um, I think I'm going to do a Patriots one as well, too, just because uh, that, that definitely <laughs> has kind of been, you know, outside of our division, one of our biggest rivals. Um, and then who knows, maybe I'll maybe I'll find just a random team in the NFC to so I can round it out. But, yeah, I'll probably be 
trying to do those next next year once the games are coming up just so people could have a little fun with it so I had to make notes for this. Um, I, I think Bill Romanowski could have been left yeah. out of that and just made his own category. Um, oh, for sure. For if sure. you're keeping track at home, you had Balco affiliations. You had yeah. uh, you had uh, allegations of racism, dirty play. Yeah. And he played for yeah. the Raiders too. Um, the only kind of redeeming thing, he's got to have some sense of humor with all the Adam oh, Sandler sure. movies he was in. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that one was definitely funny. Um, so, so the last thing I wanted to get into is uh, you, you did an article with five under the radar uh, uh-huh. playoff performers. And yeah. the three that I thought were really interesting were uh, Thornhill, uh, Daryl Williams, and, and Sorensen. So uh-huh. I, I guess between those three, what are you expecting from them in the Super yeah. Bowl, and who's going to be the one of those three that shows up the most? Honestly, I think it's going to be Thornhill. Um, I just think that, you know, with the offense that the Chiefs are going against in the Bucs, I mean, they, they like to throw the ball deep. I mean, that's kind of the whole Arians thing. Um, I think, you know, Brady was a little uncomfortable with it early on, but I, I think you you saw even in, in the Green Bay Packers game, I mean, they threw the ball deep constantly. Um, and, and Brady actually threw, I mean, through three interceptions. So yeah. I, I think, you know, especially with Thornhill seeming to kind of, you know, reacclimate himself athletically after that um, ACL injury, yep. I think he's going to be big, man, because he, he was coming on really strong at the end of last year. And, you know, I, I just think, I mean, it obviously was a bummer for him that he didn't get to to, I, I think the Chiefs would have been even more convincing if he had been able to play. And I just think, you know, having a safety with the type of, you know, speed and instincts that he has on the back of your defense, I mean, it just makes a huge difference. I mean, you know, that's that's kind of what Seattle had for several years that made their defense so imposing. And I, I really think that the Chiefs have missed that for several years. I mean, Barry had it for a while, but, you know, obviously he had – you know, injuries and health issues that kind of kept him off the field for a while. Um, but that was also, you know, back when the Chiefs defense was really, really strong when he was kind of main in the back end of that defense. So I, I think he's going to come up big. I, I would expect him to, you know, make some plays on the ball, maybe come away with an interception. Um, and then, you know, Sorensen just always it seems to be in the – he's not the most consistent producer, but he makes a play or two each game. Um, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that too. I just think Daryl Williams is probably not going to see as much production in the Super Bowl just because I think Clyde's going to be in a lot of the game and it sounds like Le'Veon's going to be in. And I just think, number one, with the Bucks pass rush, they're going to have a lot of those, you know, outlet passes to the running back just in case, you know, Mahomes gets in trouble. So, yeah, man, I expect Thornhill to have a big game. Gotcha. Good stuff. Well, thanks again for joining me for the yeah, MK yeah. Chiefs cast. And uh, I'm looking forward to the Super Bowl as much as you yeah. are. And, uh, you know, again, um, don't forget to check out Jordan's Twitter handle. Follow him at Chiefs, uh, Chief in STL dot or sorry, not dot com. It's a Twitter handle <laughs> at Chief and STL. <laughs> Wasn't that long of a day. Sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, so follow follow Jordan and Arrowhead Addict on Twitter and uh, go Chiefs. Go Chiefs. So run it back for